so let let's probably go through uh, the different sections of a protocol synopsis now this is the template for a protocol synopsis right it is also sometimes called as summary etc but the technical word for it is the synopsis you you have also heard this term earlier also so if you can go back to that slide okay now uh, this is all about volunteering right uh, anyone who wants to volunteer uh, we have mics uh, that uh, coordinators can actually pass on to you anyone who wants to take a shot at what is the title that you would want to actually talk about what's the title of the study you want to talk about no wrong answers so you don't you don't have to worry yes good can can we have a mic uh, yeah can you hear me yes ha uh, good afternoon sir i am msc second year student um, i have made uh, from symbiosis college of nursing i have just made my i am not that much uh, in you you don't have to worry about any of that we are all equal <laughs> here so go ahead okay sir a comparative study to assess the safety efficacy and reliability of the fever crusher and paracetamol 650 mg with covid 19 patients in selected community hospital in pimpri very good excellent i'm like seriously impressed right okay so let let's break it down right lot of things that you said which are all good but let's break it out so you said this is a comparative study comparative study comparative study very good this what are you comparing against the two things right paracetamol which we right now will for the for the sake of not complicating things paracetamol which is the standard of care versus fever crusher the new drug which is your test drug or test intervention as they say that you want to compare okay good then and uh, introduction no 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 in the same title Let, let's finish the title part uh, co uh, with covid 19 patient ha huh. covid 19 patient now you have to be a little bit more specific here right covid can be of people who are suspect covid cases confirm covid cases you can even have asymptomatic mild Uh, moderate severe etc so those are like very distinct right because you can't just treat a patient with paracetamol who is uh, who is almost going into icu right so you have to decide what group of patients are you going to look at most probably here you might be better off by saying patients who are confirmed covid cases who have mild symptoms right so that could be a good way to specify the population that you are testing okay go ahead and uh, in selected community hospital in pimpri excellent so you you want to restrict yourself to hospitals only in pimpri which is good there are also some bad uh, issues about that or what could be the negative repercussions of only concentrating on pimpri yes only pimpri in pimpri only will going to happen no no what could be some of the bad things that can, or rather i won't say bad negative things that can happen if you only uh, look at pimpri Yes, we are not including other hospitals. Yes, Sorry. others might feel left off. Yes, right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. But more than that. <laughs> Sorry. We can go for generalization, sir. Ah, when when the results actually come out, mm. and you have to generalize that result. So, for example, Dr. Kumar Swami did all these studies, and those were generalizable to the whole of India and even to some of the other parts of the world. But somebody might say, "Oh, but you have just done it in Pimpri." and pimpri people are so different or pimpri people are so so different in the in their physical features or all those stuff right so you might want to think about that but uh, in many a cases it's always good to have a very specific population and you're right in choosing that it is pimpri the only challenge is that sometimes covid might dry up covid patients might die uh, dry up and you will have difficulty in recruiting patients on your study so those are things that you have to uh, take care okay fantastic great so uh, good points that you raise some of the other things that you can think about in the title is you can sometimes say uh, how, how long are you going to do the study for is it for 6 months or is it for uh, one week two week etc because sometimes that period is also important because otherwise sometimes you won't kind of like have that connection as to maybe after 10 years when somebody looks at your paper which is published they will not know when you had actually done this study right uh, then you can also decide whether you are going to do an open label study 
or is it a randomized controlled study? Open label study means? What does open label study mean? You have two medications, right? Parastamol and fever, fever crusher. Open label means both the doctor who is going to give the treatment as part of the trial and the patient knows what they are getting, right? So that is open label. Randomized control study means ah, you, you are not deciding who is going to get what. That is decided based on a random number or a, uh, you could say there are different ways of randomization, but it's not dependent upon the investigator. So the investigator does not decide, isko ye denge, ye, uh, next person ko ye denge, tisare ko ye denge. That, that's not the way it is done. So you can decide that. When you have blinding or randomization and blinding, what, what will that enhance? It will enhance the validity of your results, right? So there are two terms that I bring. One is randomization. Randomization is a procedure which takes away bias. What kind of bias? Do you know the term bias? What is bias? Sorry? Huh. Or partiality, right? When you say bias, you have racial bias and all these stuff. So it's a, it's a kind of partiality. What kind of bias are you preventing when you have randomized, uh, randomization? Ah, selection bias. You are not deciding what you are going to assign which patient. So maybe five patients come to your clinic. You are not going to say this first person will get this drug, second will get this, the other drug, third will get again the uh, paracetamol, fourth will get the this thing. So because you will know who's got what, right? So that's the uh, randomization is going to prevent the selection bias. There's another term, blinding. What does that term mean? in the uh, realm of clinical research, when you say you are going to blind the study. Yes? Huh. Ah, so blinding also can be of different types. There can be a single blind. Uh, single, the knows uh, the only the investigator know. knows who is getting what. Double blind means both the investigator and the patient doesn't know who is getting what. And then, so then the question is that, who knows that? Ah, the analyzer who is usually the sponsor of the study or the, uh, you could say, whoever is going to analyze the data. There can also be triple blinding. What is that? Ah, even the people who are doing the statistical analysis doesn't know until the blind is broken. Right? Until the blind is broken. So all these, are, there are also other kinds of blinding, etc. But for keeping it simple, uh, we introduce two terms. One, it can be randomized control study and it can also be blinded. You can also have randomized open label. All these permutation combinations are possible, but let's not kind of like make it more complicated. So good. So that's your title. Then, what is your rationale? or your introduction and rationale. Anyone? Very brief. I don't want a lengthy paragraph that you want to say. What, 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 why are you doing this study? Or what are you trying to prove? That is ob obviously your objective, but why are you doing your study is your introduction and rationale. Yes. Ah, so you want to see if fever crusher is, can be a good treatment option for patients of COVID who have or patients with mild COVID infection because sometimes everyone gets paracetamol and sometimes paracetamol might not be the best thing, right? So you have another drug which can also be used. Great. Then what else can you think about? In the rationale, what else can you think about? Just to, just to find out whether this drug works or not, is that, is that the only reason? Ah, you also want to find whether this drug is safe, right? Proving safety is a big thing, right? Uh, the whole drug development and discovery thing, the emphasis on safety is much, much more than on efficacy. Only if the drug is proved as safe, it can move, move from phase one to phase two to phase three. 
whereas efficacy is always considered more towards in the phase 3. So, here you want to prove that it is safe. Lot of people are saying, Are sir, ekdam jabardas dawai ye. Naya jo market mein ye fever crusher na, sabka dawai do do dalta hai. But you don't know whether it is safe or not. It might be uh, bringing down the fever like anything. But patients might having a kidney problem. Or patients might have, you could say, a renal uh, issues like a kidney shutdown and all these things. You never know, right? Okay, then. What what are you trying to prove? That is your objective. Anyone? Yes. Okay, great, uh, excellent. I I want to uh, you could say ask you why why do you think she has used the term effectiveness? Of course, she can tell it herself, but <laughs> maybe I'll ask others. Why do you think she used the term, uh, we want to test the effectiveness, safety, and tolerability of fever crusher versus paracetamol, right? So why, did she, why do you think she used the term effectiveness? Huh, it's a comparative study, yes. So there is a small nuance between efficacy and effectiveness, these two terms. Efficacy is a term which is usually used in clinical trials. Effectiveness is the term for efficacy that you would use for drugs which are already marketed. So in the case of fever crusher, it is already in the market, right? That's how people are able to get it, right? So remember, when people, when scientists use the term effectiveness, these are usually for studying drugs which are already marketed. It's a minor, uh, I would say, semantics that is we are playing with. But as people who are going to be trained in clinical research today, I want you to take this away from it. Okay, so we are testing effectiveness, uh, tolerability, and safety, three things. What is tolerability? What is the difference between safety and tolerability? Anyone? Hmm. Huh. Huh. So you're saying tolerability is the upper extreme of uh, safety? Okay, okay. So there are many situations where people are willing to take a drug because the drug is very efficacious, uh, but they, they want to kind of like go to the maximum level of that drug or the maximum dose of the drug because that's when you get the best efficacy of it, right? So the drug might produce nausea, vomiting, etc., at, even at a lower dose. But at an extreme dose, it might produce, say, something like uh, cardiac pain or heart pain or, or, say, for example, neurological disturbance, etc. So you want to find out what could be the maximum dose that you could find out. In this study, do you think you will be able to do that? You are just testing one dose of fever crusher versus paracetamol 650 milligram, right? So you are not probably going to be able to find out the tolerability in a study like this. For tolerability, you will have to have different dose levels. So maybe fever crusher at 200 milligram, 300 milligram, 450 milligram, 600 milligram, depending upon what kind of doses are there. And then you have to correlate the efficacy or the effectiveness that you're finding out at these different dose. That's the only way you can find out the tolerability. But good effort, okay. How will you, uh, okay, so that's the, uh, the objective that is there. Uh, I also want to club this with the endpoints. What are you going to test, uh, or what are you going to uh, make it as, how, how do you find out whether paracetamol versus uh, fever crusher is of benefit? What is your endpoint that you're going to test? Um, if anyone wants to answer, please raise your hand so we can pass a mic to you so it's audible to the whole audience, please. Um, so to uh, have an uh, versus effect, we can make a questionnaire and a feedback. Questionnaire for those who are taking this traditional treatment and the feedback who has taken the fever pressure so that we can analyze what uh, could be done. Madam, in today's time, do you think people will believe on a questionnaire when it is COVID? 
yeah right? but a comparative analysis we need to have both kind of patients okay so that might be more like taller uh, you could say the drug is safe etc or what do you feel did it affect your sleep or were you able to go to work the next day those are things but what are the hard end points that you will want to find out in the study like this what is the most important thing that you will you will try to find in a covid study whether the drug works or not effectiveness maybe ah uh -huh. what symptoms so what symptoms fever right whether the drug is de decreasing the fever and by what day is the fever going away right that's the key thing that you will test in a covid study what else huh ah oxygen saturation right whether it is leading to any further fall in oxygen you don't expect too much of issues when a mild case but if patients are actually deteriorating that means that the drug is not of any benefit so at least these couple of things you can actually keep as your main end points now let's go to the setting you have talked about the setting right you are going to study this in the a couple of hospitals in pimpri right that is your setting you will also have to state whether it is an opd study or a in patient study where do you want to do the study uh, you would rather do it as an opd basis right because why why do you want to keep mild patients with mild covid in the hospital first of all they might be very worried that i have to stay in a hospital where there might be other cases of covid right okay uh we talked about the design so there these are these are some of the other terms that you can actually look at uh whether it is a survey whether it is a interventional study what is a retrospective you are collecting data in the past so for example you are just looking at the patient's medical records in the past and finding out whether they had this thing or not cross sectional what is a cross sectional study it's like taking a photograph like i want to find out how many people are sleeping with their eyes open during my lecture <laughs> right so i know there are people who can do that i myself used to do it in my uh, medical lectures right so so that is a cross sectional study then prospective means you are going to find it out into the uh, future parallel group versus crossover what does that mean parallel group means your kind of like one arm is given paracetamol other arm is given fever crusher you are you are kind of like following them up for one week or two week and the study ends you can also do a crossover study in the first period you give one group paracetamol another group fever crusher they might get better and then you can do a crossover but in this case you can't do a crossover because you will otherwise have to expose them again to covid right so that's not ethical right but uh, crossover designs are sometimes used in some kind of studies where uh, say for example patients with diabetes or others you can sometimes do a crossover kind of design then we talked about the open label single blind and the double blind we also talked about the patient numbers right how many patients do you think this i'm i'm not we are not going to go into statistics but how much how many number of patients do you think we should study hmm 100 200 kon banega karodpadi ha how many how many do you need oh, what do you think uh, who uh, if you if you are on the other side you are another patient and you are reading this data and you say that they did a study in 100 patients and found out that fever crusher is better than paracetamol and you'll think oh okay should i take it or not but if you hear that it was done in 550 patients will that make you more comfortable why ah so more sample size is better is that what you feel <laughs> not necessary right so sample size is dependent on lot of things like what is the difference that you want to show between paracetamol and the new drug that you are going to find out so that is called as the clinical significance that you have to find out 
So the, uh, we will not go into uh, sample size calculation, but the sample size is a very important part of whether your study is going to be relevant or not. If you do it in too small a population, people will say it is a pilot study. If you do it in too big a number, what is the problem? It's an ethical issue, right? Why do you have to expose so many patients to a drug which you are not yet uh, proved, right? So you have to have a valid or a scientifically valid sample size and there are reasons of how to get it. And then we talked about these intervention, etc. And in the last part, we will talk about the <coughs> data analysis plan. So in short, you can actually, uh, uh, within this blueprint, what do you think is the most important thing that you have to uh, take time and think through? What is the most important thing? Excellent, the objectives of the study, right? You have to be clear what you are trying to prove here, right? If your objectives are not clear, you will be muddled in how you plan the study, do the study, etc., etc. Your ob Once your objective and the rationale for why you are doing the study is clear, rest of the parts will kind of like flow through. So your rationale for doing the study or your objectives and of course then the study design which is linked to all that, if these are kind of like taken care, then you will not have an issue, okay? So once you have uh, done the synopsis, you can actually make it into the full protocol. Okay, so uh, before we get into, uh, you could say what is needed as a uh, uh, requirement, a little bit of, uh, you could say, soul searching is also required, right? Uh, um, um, Dr. Kumar Swami has been talking about the importance of research linked to clinical practice. And uh, in India, if you look at, uh, you could say, medical training as well as research, People who finish their MBBS, uh, many of them go to clinical practice, but now those numbers are becoming lesser because everyone has to go through the entrance exam and then get into uh, an MD or an MS or uh, a DNB or a diplomat uh, uh, or DCH or others. And then of these also, a lot of people actually go into clinical practice and uh, in, in today's time, I think many would actually go into uh, again, the specialization, uh, you go into a super specialization, which is DM or MCH. And it is only the very, very rare, uh, you could say, breed of individuals who become what is known as the physician scientist. Dr. Kumar Swami is an example of that breed, uh, a small tribe of individuals who are there, uh, who actually do both clinical care as well as uh, do their own research, including uh, investment, etc. So uh, if you look at why do research at all, I think uh, these are not just philosophical musings, but uh, uh, you could say a clinical training or a clinician is supposed to actually do four different types of activity always. One is of course patient care, teaching, administration and research. And these are four pillars of what they are supposed to actually be doing. And then of course, a lot of things which uh, Dr. Kumar Swami has uh, talked about how evidence-based medicine actually makes patient care itself better, right? And uh, in, in many of the other developed world, I think a lot of those things actually are also given a lot of credence. Uh, but of course, in a country like us where patient numbers are, you could say, mind-boggling, uh, the concept of protected time for research is something which can be a very challenging thing to happen. And that's where I think institutions like uh, symbiosis can actually lead the way. Because, uh, uh, let me kind of like skip the slide. Uh, you could say uh, the importance of uh, institutions like symbiosis is that they will be able to kind of like give that level of protected time for clinicians who are doing research, right? Because this is an educational institution ultimately. Uh, and uh, within clinical research also, we, we see that there are a lot, lot of different breeds of individuals. One group of uh, clinical investigators are those who have 
a very well set establishment for doing research, right? It's like a factory, right? You can actually do a lot of research, bring a lot of evidence-based guidelines, influence policy and other things. And, and we see that uh, for many of them, I don't know whether this is working or not. Uh, uh, you can just keep clicking. Uh, you could say sometimes it becomes like uh, they, they're looking at the highest form of the scientific engagement as a fruit of its own uh, benefit, right? So that is about advisory board meetings, networking with their peers, etc. And then uh, this is the standard one which is there, like investigators who want to do research but patient care is their primary interest. So almost all government institutions as well as many of the big private uh, uh, medical institutions would fall into that uh, frame. And then uh, there are like uh, the typical government hospital, uh, you could say academicians, who sometimes actually are pushed into doing clinical research because uh, now for getting promotions, etc., you need to have papers which are published, etc. So that's, that's the third group of individuals that are there. And then, for example, sometimes uh, there are institutions where the HOD says that, okay, you just uh, get something done because that's, that's important both not only for the institution but also for the department, et cetera. So uh, more for furthering the academic, uh, this thing. Now, there is no right or wrong here, right? Depending upon which kind of institution you are, you might fall into one of them. Now, uh, the institution also has a lot of... Uh, uh, yeah, so there is also a lot of benefit for the institution. Uh, yeah, and, and this is what I want to actually talk about because there are uh, uh, symbiosis as an institution can actually influence this in a big way. One is the hospital or the institutional leadership also has a big role to play. One is, of course, uh, the opportunity uh, that if you are doing more research, you will be able to also provide patients better care or differential care. And, and an example of this is that, say for example, if you have medical oncology, right, or, uh, or cancer care. Now cancer care is a place where there's a lot more research which is happening and for many, many treatments, the only option is to go into a clinical trial, right? So if you are an institution which is doing a lot of research, that naturally will attract a lot of patients to come to your institution and also will increase your standing, etc. There are also certain research accreditations like AHAR, uh, FER, uh, FERC or FERCAP, etc., which actually raises the standard. So you know that the NABH accreditation is a standard which almost all institutions have to follow. But a research accreditation called as the AHARP or the FERC uh, or the FERCAP accreditation also gives a third party person, uh, which is like a, 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 a group which actually gives the grant for doing research, look at the institution in a better light. And then that could also be, also lead to further collaborations which would come from institutions like the Wellcome Trust or uh, you could say the NIH or others. So these are all institutional bodies which actually look at whether your research environment in the institution is good or not. And then of course, research also is a byproduct of human resource development, not just for life sciences or medical students, but also for others who are doing uh, their institutional work. And for the institution also, it is a big revenue earner in a long way. We can, we can skip all this. Next slide. One more. Yeah. So uh, in the institution, sometimes for doing research, you also might want to think about setting up something called as the clinical research secretary. Now, this is a unit which can actually be the front face of doing research for the institution. It can have the ability to look at providing human resources. It can uh, also enable the institutions or the different departments to provide instruments, technology services, like for example, uh, some of the contracts and others which Dr. Kumar Swami was saying, uh, expert consultation for protocol development, 
uh, providing reward and recognition for the staff that is working in the different departments, etc. So all of these can also be a centralized role that can be played by one group of individuals which is called as the clinical research secretary. Uh, can go to the next slide. Okay, now if you're doing research in India, uh, it can be either academic research or it can be pharmaceutical industry sponsored research. Now, both are very different in many ways because the approving bodies are uh, very different. So, the regulatory agency in India for approving clinical trials or pharmaceutical products is called as the DCGI or the body is called as CDSO or Central uh, Drug Standard Control Organization. That's a full form of that. Uh, uh, the, the person who's heading is called as the Drugs Controller General of India. They're based out of Delhi. Uh, in all the documents, the regulatory documents, they are known as the Central Licensing Authority. This is the nodal agency for, you could say, uh, approving and licensing uh, clinical trials as well as drugs in, the bo in India. They work through the clinical trial rules which are there, and uh, there are also a lot of rules which actually govern clinical trials in a way. <coughs> for many of the researchers, what is more important is ICMR. What is ICMR? Indian Council of Medical Research. Again, that's a premier body just like the US would have National Institute of Health. The similar body in India is called as Indian Council for Medical Research. And there are also other bodies like Department of Biotechnology, CSIR and all these others, but ICMR is by far uh, the central body which is involved in formulation, coordination and promotion of biomedical research. And if you're doing a study in the medical institution and you're not going to do a drug study or an interventional study or you're not going to do a, drug, a study with an intervention which is not yet approved in the country, then uh, you can actually approach Department of Health Research. Now, Department of Health Research has a website which actually has a lot of different elements there, like including uh, common ethics committee uh, review forms, uh, if, you, if you have to take help in protocol designing, if you have to take help in, uh, you could say, other things like uh, HMSC, which is like if you are actually having a collaborative study across the world and your institution is one of the government institution which is actually part of the study. So if it's a collaborative study, then you will have to take uh, the approval through, again, the Department of Health Research, which is all sitting with the Ministry of Health and uh, Family Welfare. So these are some of the uh, requirements that have to be looked at and uh, the guidance which actually is followed is the ICMR guidelines which came out in 2017. So for clinical trials, you approach DCGI. For uh, studies which do not have uh, drugs or drugs which are not yet approved in India, uh, or rather, if you're not doing a clinical trial with a, uh, with a drug which is not already approved in India, then you can actually go to the ICMR. Now, what do you mean by an academic trial? Right? So even the regulations actually say what is an academic trial. So this is a clinical trial of a drug which is already approved in the country. And uh, if, if, it is for a, if it is for a new indication or a new route of administration, or a new dose or new dosage form, all of these are, you could say, what falls into the category of a new drug, right? Anything which falls under this is a new drug. Now, if you are actually doing with a drug which is already approved, and you know the indications for that drug which is already approved, and you're doing a study, and sometimes that uh, indication is also, say, sometimes different. Say, for example, you have a drug which is approved for uh, say a condition like malaria, but you find out that this drug is also very good and works for a condition like influenza. Now it's not in the label, not in the approved label, but you want as a researcher, you want to do a study with that particular drug, then you can still do it like an academic research, but 
you cannot use the data from the study in order to approach the regulatory agency, say that, okay, we have done the study, now you give us approval for treating patients with influenza. So if you are not going to seek an approval for the new indication, it is also okay to do a study with the, uh, uh, the newer indications which are not approved by the regulatory agency, right? So these are some of the uh, nuances around where do you actually define it as an academic study and where do you actually say that it is a clinical trial which has to be approved by the regulatory agency. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, academic research can also involve those which are on the basic and the applied and the operational side of things. Like for example, you want to do a survey. You want to find out how many children in say uh, walked area is malnourished, right? So if you're doing some, something like that, that could also fall within the uh, remit of the academic research. You don't have to go to the regulatory agency to get a approval for doing such kind of study. So any studies which involve in vitro diagnostics where you are doing performance testing for research, any new surgical intervention, assisted reproductive technology, public health surveys, all these are governed by academic research policy which is the ICMR guidelines, right? So you don't have to go to the regulatory agency to, for getting approval. Now, before you actually start a, a study, whether it is an academic study or whether it is a regulatory study, you have to make sure that if you are using an intervention, you are mandated to give free medical management in case the patient has a safety issue. Example, you are doing an academic study with a drug which is already approved in the market and in an indication also which is approved in the market. And three days later, the patient has a heart attack and the patient is uh, coming from the house to your clinic and the patient says that I don't know what happened but I have a heart attack and I need to be treated. You, are, you have to provide them with medical management. It does not say that you have to give a stent or a PTCA or some complicated uh, intervention but you have to give the basic medical management that is required irrespective of whether it is a drug study or whether it is an academic study. The second thing is that in case the patient dies in your clinical trial, whether it is an academic clinical trial or whether it is a regulatory clinical trial, you have to provide what is called as a compensation. Provided it is, you could say, related to the intervention that you have given, right? So for example, a patient who, ha who dies because of a heart attack in a study where you are actually doing a skin application of a drug, that may not be really be correlated or what, what they call as causality of the drug is not clearly correlated. But in that case, you still have to give medical management. Maybe the compensation may not be, uh, uh, you could say, be required to be given. So these are some of the requirements that are there uh, in the, uh, you could say, uh, studies. Now, before you start the study, and this is my last slide for this particular session, before you start the study, uh, like uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy said, it is important to develop a site team. You can't do research alone, right? It is very, very important. You have to check that your institutional ethics committee or if you are in a private clinic, and you have an independent ethics committee to whom you are asking for approval, you make sure that those uh, ethics committees are registered under the CDSO or the Department of Health Research. You can't actually say that I, I just thought that I, I went to this ethics committee and they approved my study. If they are not registered, then that's bad news for you. So if the institute is not having their own ethics committee, they can also go, the investigator can go outside and get uh, approval, provided the ethics committee is within 50 kilometers of the site where the research is being done. Uh, as always, even if you're doing an academic study, make sure that your uh, study does not fall into the regulatory requirements for getting approval. If it is, you have to go to the DCGI 
it's an online submission process, but you have to get that approval. If you are in a central government institution, you might sometimes have to go for an HMSC approval, which is like, uh, it's a collaborative study and you have to send samples of blood samples or others outside, then you have to get a special additional permission. Before you even enroll a patient, uh, you have to register the study in what is called as the Clinical Trials Registry of India or CTRI. This is a portal which has the details of all the clinical trials which are ongoing in India so that anyone can actually access them, right? So it's like a public facing uh, website where anyone with a particular disease who wants to be part of a clinical trial can go and find where these kind of studies are being done and approach those investigators to be part of it. You also have to have insurance before you start your study. Even if you think that it's a small study, nothing will happen, nobody will get hurt, maybe disaster might fall, right? And then you will have to find out how to manage those uh, situations. So you have to have insurance and other arrangements for managing patients in case of a research injury that happens in your study. Now, institution might say, how do I actually get a research insurance? So that is where uh, an institution can take what is called as an umbrella insurance. For all the research that is going on in, say, symbiosis, you can have an umbrella insurance which covers all the studies. And that can be like for one crore or two crore or five crore, etc., depending upon the volume of studies that are ongoing. So these are uh, you could say some of the rough, uh, you could say, things that you need to think about before you actually start a study in your institution. Okay. Uh, I, I, there are, of course, more slides and others, uh, but the, uh, we'll be happy to share these slides, but uh, the, this is probably the gist of what you would want to know. Okay. With that, we come to the last session uh, for today, which is on... Uh, the last uh, presentation. Now that you have done your research and you have collected to the collected the data, what do you do with it, right? So that's that's our uh, you could say this thing. So uh, we we talked from the afternoon about how research can actually change policies, how research can change guidelines, how research can influence clinical practice, right? All of this happens based on the data that you actually collect. So uh, the way that you actually find out whether an intervention works or not follows a, a schema. And the schema is that uh, when, I, when I talked about doing the study between uh, paracetamol and fever crusher, you said that you will do the study in one locality, right? So <clears throat> that one locality is your sample. You can have similar such samples which are taken. The data that you get from a sample has to be extrapolated to the bigger world. So that is how you actually do research. You actually do your study in a sample and the results that you get, you extrapolate it to the wider population. And depending upon how the extrapolation happens, it provides guidance for clinical practice which is an individual base or it could be for a wider population, which is like change in the policy, which is called as the advocacy part of, uh, you could say, research. Now, once the data is gathered, or you get all the data in your Excel sheet, etc., there are a lot of things that you need to look at. Uh, I mean, you would think that it's all done by statistician, but sometimes as a clinical researcher, you also need to have a look at it. Now, you look at the completeness of the data. See if there are a lot of missing values. If there are a lot of missing values, then the data becomes much weaker. But if the data has all the visits and all the others, uh, uh, all the other data filled in, then that is a very good and complete data. Analysis of a complete data is much better than analysis of data which has a lot of missing values. And then you actually look at whether there are what is called as outliers or aberrant values. You'll have to find out whether, why is there an aberrant value. Is, there, is, is it because of chance or is it because, say for example, somebody did the analysis of the sample in a different way. 
somebody, some, somebody did not follow the SOP that was supposed to be uh, followed with regards to, uh, you could say, doing a particular intervention. An example, uh, there is a test called a six-minute walk test. The six-minute walk test was famous during the COVID times, right? But the six-minute walk test actually was brought in in cardiovascular research, especially in conditions like pulmonary artery hypertension, etc., where it looks at whether the uh, how long can the patient actually walk. So six minutes, if you are able to walk, that means that you are able to kind of like have a good respiratory capacity. Now, if, it, if that is not done properly, then you will get erroneous values. So in one of our sites, we, we kind of like started the study uh, and we went for monitoring the site and we asked them, how do you do the six minute walk test? So they said that uh, we tell the patient, aap jao, aap chalte raho, che minute ke liye chalte raho, aur fir hame aake batao. And then we found out that there are a lot of patients who are going and having tea. And then after 10 minutes, they will come. And then the coordinator was recording that six minute walk test was complete. So if the SOPs are not followed, so six minute walk test has an SOP that you need to have a distance which is marked and the patient has to mark, uh, keep walking only in that distance. And then you have to assess how many minutes that person is able to walk before they start to have breathlessness, right? You can't just say that aap chalte raho aur baad mein aajao, hum batayenge ki aapka kaisa hai karke, right? So, when you have outlier or aberrant values, you will have to ask whether somebody did not follow the SOP or somebody did not do the test in the proper way. If you have a small sample, you can arrange the data in ascending or descending order, state the highest and lowest values, if you have a large sample, then you, you then statistics actually come into being. You might have to express, uh, uh, there are two types of data. One is called as categorical data, another is called as quantitative. So categorical data is also called as qualitative data. So things like color of your hair, uh, uh, right-handed, left-handed, these are all categorical data. Quantitative data is measurements, like for example, hemoglobin value. Uh, HDL value or LDL value, all these are. So depending upon what kind of data you are analyzing, uh, your uh, analysis also goes in that way. Uh, so <laughs> if, uh, for my young friends, my uh, sincere, uh, you could say, recommendation to you before you embark on the journey of research is that have a statistician as your friend, right? Because statisticians should not be used to just analyze the data at the end of the study. Because if you do that, then your data will be of no use. You will have to start involving the statistician when you design the study. Like for example, I have an idea. Okay, let me, let me not just write it down myself, but let me also discuss what can I do with the data? How, do, how will I analyze the data? Will I be able to make sense of the data that comes out, right? So a statistician is a very important person who has to be, uh, you could say, involved in your research upfront and not at the end of the study when you have collected all the data and then you figure out whom to uh, get the data to be analyzed, etc. And uh, you will also realize when uh, in, in later years that statisticians can do a lot of these JASI tests, right? Uh, which are like based on playing around p-values and all that stuff. But the most important thing is that you need to understand what you want to get from your data, right? That is the key to the whole exercise. Next slide. So uh, many a times uh, our concern is that how do I actually understand uh, analysis of the data, which is using statistics, right? Many a times, uh, these are all very abstract terms that are used, uh, like uh, error of the data, hypothesis, significance, and all that stuff. And as a person, uh, I'm, I'm a bit uh, kind of like uh, numerophobic, and, uh, and the only thing that I'm actually happy is when I see figures like this. Oops, sorry. Yeah. These kind of figures, I'm very happy to see, right? These statistics, I am happy to see. But 
the other kind of figures are not very happy. But within clinical practice, statistics is there in nature, right? So for example, uh, any th anything which is a biological parameters, whether it is hemoglobin values or LDL values or all these things, they all fall in a normal range, right? So which means that within nature itself, there is statistics which is playing out for uh, all these things. So if statistics is playing a big role and uh, you could say, I'm not, able to kind of like pace myself, the most important thing is to remember that when you're actually doing a research, you are not able to do the study in the entire population. You are able to do the study only in a sample. And from that sample, uh, keep, keep uh, pushing. From that sample that you're doing the study, you actually extrapolate the results that you actually get. So once you find that sample, and this doesn't seem to be working. Okay. Okay. So uh, coming to my last part, and then I'll let uh, Dr. Kumar Swami also then uh, give a update. So when you are actually doing uh, the analysis of your data, there are two ways to look at the analysis. The first part is called as the descriptive statistics or the descriptive analysis. These are mainly asking questions like how many are there, uh, how many did you get. Uh, so these are like uh, uh, measurements of height, weight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the bigger thing uh, in clinical research is using what is called as the inferential statistics. Inferential statistics are the most important four things are, one is called as hypothesis testing. Hypothesis means example. We, we looked at the example of using paracetamol versus fever crusher in patients with mild COVID infection, right? We want to know whether one drug is better than the other, like fever crusher is better than paracetamol or not. So your, what is your hypothesis then? What will be your hypothesis? One hypothesis. One hypothesis that you are going to prove is paracetamol is better than fever crusher. If you are able to disprove your hypothesis, then that means your study is successful. Right? So you might be thinking in the reverse, but your hypothesis has to be that paracetamol is superior to that of fever crusher. And if you are able to disprove this hypothesis, then your study is successful, right? So that is hypothesis testing. Confidence interval is you are trying to find out where your data is going to be in an 80 percentage of population. So in simple words, what you mean by confidence intervals is that if I look at 80% of the population, will my data fit into that particular range, right? Of course, there are further explanation to that. I don't want to uh, get into that. Correlation. You want to find out whether there is any correlation between two factors, which is influenced by the intervention. Like for example, in, in our example again, fever crusher versus paracetamol, if there is a decrease in, uh, you could say, or, or say there is an improvement in saturation levels. You might say that there is a correlation between using the drug and the particular endpoint. Or if you say that the CD4 T cells are increasing when we use fever crusher, then we can say that there is a correlation between use of fever crusher and the CD4 T cell count. Significance testing is you want to find out whether there is a difference between the two intervention. And for that, you can use tests like T-test, uh, Wilcoxon, uh, uh, rank test, and all these, all these uh, uh, you could say, statistical tests that are there. But uh, just to kind of like uh, remember, when you're having data, there are two types of analysis that is possible. One is called as descri using descriptive statistics. Another is using inferential statistics, where these four things are being looked at, hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, correlation, 
and significance testing. Okay.